this time on Genie Vision, we're stepping into the time machine and traveling back to 1984. Yes, chums, I'm sorry it's been a while, but we've finally got round to looking at the second half of 1984 in personal computer news to see all the computers and things that were going on in the second half of 1984, split 1984 into two, because 1984 is such a massive year in 8-bit computing and general computing, so many machines being released. And as you can see here, here we are on July 21st, and the Einstein has been released. And so we just scroll through this issue and have a look and see what's going on. It's the middle of summer, so there's not much going on in the news. But we've got some interesting things going on in the games chart. TLL is number one. And uh, Jet Set Willie's still hanging in there. Um, down from number 12 to number 22, dropping off there. A lot of games you have heard of. Um, it's starting to get more mainstream now in terms of games. The kind of companies coming in, you see more ocean some of those big names. Digital Integration are doing well in the charts there. Names like Melbourne House as well and US Gold and some of the smaller software houses no longer being seen. And we'll just look at what Micros are doing, selling as well. Uh, the Amazon CPC won't be out yet or it will be... There'll be some in the shops but it won't be filtering through to these charts yet. So we'll be seeing that filter into the charts very soon. But Spectrum, Commodore and Electron dominate the top of the charts but let's go find the uh, let's go find the Einstein and see what's going on with that here we go the leader article Einstein's theory I don't think I've ever seen one of these actually working I've seen one just sitting there doing anything in a museum but I've never seen one actually working so quite a nice display that that's a standard I think no, I think the display will be extra there's the machine there's the three inch floppy there um, shared with the Amstrad CPC. Of course, uh, people say Amstrad made weird choice in terms of using the three-inch disc. No, it wasn't. It was a perfectly viable format uh, when both Tate and, and, and Amstrad were choosing it. Um, there's no reason why not to use it. Uh, certainly much cheaper to, than the new three-and-a-half-inch disc, which were incredibly expensive. And of course, a five-inch disc would be massive. So why wouldn't this format take off? As Britain's big names have stolen the limelight and made the BBC and QL household names, well, QL? Hmm. The UK arm of Taiwanese electronics company has been beavering away in a Bradford building, a machine that promises to compete with them both. Hmm. Known mainly for its televisions and cooling fans, never heard of them before, but perhaps they were known back then. Tating has bought out a £500 machine devoid of technological marvels, but high in the easy-to-use stakes. Called the Einstein's Tating's Microbes, followed the example set by the famous Albert, in that, like him... It avoids cluttering its memory with useless facts. It separates its program and video memories so space is not based on the things you'll never use. In fact, it has all the feel of a machine that Acorn should have built for the BBC contract with 64K of RAM, a separate 16K of video memory, an integral disk drive coupled with a Z80A processor. And that's an inter interesting point there from PCN. And it's designed for top end of the home range or bottom end of the small business market. Let's scroll down. That's a big old board in there. Not, not a lot of wasted space. A lot of wasted space in there. I suppose it has to be big enough for the monitor to go on top of it. But, um, yeah. So, uh, hardware. Tatung has you... Tat is it Tatung? Tatung? I don't know, really. Um, has used the time since the launch of the BBC to design and build a project with comparable specifications without the limitations Good quality graphics and a disc can be used without reducing the space of programs to a few K of RAM. That's the big problem with the BBC Micro. got all those fancy screen modes, but they use the RAM, so you don't end up with much left. Especially when you've got the Electron, which doesn't have much RAM to begin with. You can end up with hardly anything left. So, uh, yeah, you can connect all sorts of different floppies into it. We get a three-inch built-in. They found the standard floppy to be very slow um, and time-consuming. It's interesting. Expansion is possible because Tatung has designed in a pipe connector which looks like the BBC's tube, which brings the microprocessor signals out of the back of the case. So that must be that. Got from my cursor, that must be that there. And it, yeah, it does look like the connector at the back of the BBC Micro, doesn't it, really, with all those pins and. Well, not at the back, the ones underneath the keyboard on the master. That's what it looks like. 
verdict, even with the many small problems in the review model's hardware and documentation, I would still consider buying this machine. Acorn and Sinclair would have to cross my hand with as much silver to persuade me to buy one of their machines now. Interesting, because, uh, of course, this, this was a flop. Um, and I've got specs, 499, 499. With 249 for that extra colour monitor, Z88 at 4 megahertz, uh, 64k of RAM, 16k of video memory, and 8k of ROM. So it's got 16k of dedicated video memory. But other than that, the specification looks very similar to the Amstrad CPC, doesn't it? Especially with the colour graphics. Uh, the screen's 256 by 198 pixels, and uh, it comes with XTAL DOS, which is CPM compatible. And I'm just scrolling down to page 35 here, and we've got an advert here. First indication the Amstrad is actually on sale, even though it isn't in the software or the hardware chart so yet. Amstrad available now. Order by telephone for immediate dispatch. Also immediate dispatch upon check clearance. 229 green screen, 329 color monitor. Order by mail. Computer Rama, Dept PCM 111 Market Square, Arcade, Hanley, Stoke on Trent. And uh, £16 to get uh, courier. Uh, cost as much incredibly expensive. We had, think about that would be equivalent to today about forty pounds. Would you buy a what thirty five? Let's say, let's be generous and say thirty five. If you were buying a brand new computer via mail order, would you pay thirty five pounds for the mail for your your courier? Different times, different times. We move on to August twenty fifth, nineteen eighty four. So I think should be hotting up now after that dull summer period where nothing ever happens. We got the definitive. QL review here in PCN. Also stuff about Spectrum Commodore 64 as well, and the Memtech and the Oric. Still that Wild West with all these different machines floating around this Christmas will clear out a lot of that stuff as well because a lot of machines are going to fall by the wayside. Oh, the sale of Dragon Data's assets to Euroheart of Europe, Spain could turn out to be a bigger boost for Dragon users than first appeared. Clue. It won't be. Eurohard and his sister company Eurosoft were set up with the specific intention of manufacturing the Dragon in Spain as a spearhead of Spain's move into the information technology. I'll get on the road and speak to a company called Indescomp, who uh, could be shortly be, or are by now importing lots and lots of Amstrad CPCs into the country. Um, so that's that's where that's going. But um, yeah, Dragon's, Dragon's dead by now, really. Um, a lot of these computers, Oric, Dragon machines like that, they're, they're all dead in the water and they're floundering around trying to get rescued. But it's it just, it, it, the market's saturated. Nobody wants these machines. Um, Atari has taken a hint from the London store and knocked down the price of its XL range. They're already knocking down their prices before Christmas. And, uh, oh, there we go, an MPC 100 MSX, which will hit the shops in October for two nine nine ninety five. That's the we reviewed one of those on Chinivision a while back. Quite a nice MSX machine. Um, only has composite output, um, which is why I got rid of mine because I need RGB for the for the channel really. So um, and also got the MSX two, so it was really surplus to requirements. But a nice machine though, quite well built. Um, one of the early MSX machines. You've got the Toshiba coming out as well. The HX ten, which is being released this week. And uh, talk about computer companies collapsing. No surrender, says Oric. Rumours of an early bar for Oric Products International have reached such a pitch that the company has issued a statement to combat them. In the past week, Oric's debts have been put as high as £4 million and has even been suggested the company might pull out of the UK market. And Oric has helped things along by cutting 15 staff at its Ascot HQ. Oric concedes the redundancies have been taken place, but points out there have been 15 new recruits to its operation in Europe. Sure, that's... Uh, a lot of comfort to the 15 poor so-and-sos who have been let go at the Ascot HQ. Um, the company refuses to absolutely to suggestions it is planning to pull out of the UK market. Well, you did. So, bye-bye, <laughs> Oric. I want to find the software charts and see, or the hardware charts, and see if the Amstrad's in there yet. Here goes the game charts. Full throttle by Micro and Mega is number one. Sable Wolf, number two, match point. Number three and Beachhead number four. Let's look at the micro charts and see if we've got. There we go. Amstrad CPC, new entry number seven. It hit the shops last month. It is now starting to make an impact. It's got a dragon at number 10. And you know, that's, it's, it's static at number 10. 
I mean, who's buying a Dragon now? I mean, I guess they're all being reduced. Uh, the 800 XL, number 9, the Oric at number 8. Again, who's buying them? It's pretty obvious Oric are going to collapse, and there's going to be no more software or anything for your computer. In number 6, the Memtech. Oh, is it Memotech? I think it's Memotech. It's Memotech 500 in number 6. The, the Elk has shot down to number 5 from number 3. Vic 20 static at 4. BBC Micro at 3. I imagine that's shooting up because of the new school year. People buying them for the new school year. Gondor 64 at 2. Spectrum at number 1. Here we are. Dongle free QLs are poised to arrive on the streets. The hardware, the software, and the super basic got a long cool look from PCN. At long last, the Sinclair QL computers are becoming available. Everyone who ordered the computer just after the launch should now have received it. Oh, I think uh, Vega uh, crowdfunders would be familiar with uh, what went on with Sinclair. Except, except, of course, the QL did actually turn up in the end. Will the Q Vega Plus turn up? Hmm, chin you reckon? Um, according to Sinclair, things are going so well, you should be able to buy the QL in the high street shops from next month. Since the QR first made an appearance, there have been a few changes in both the software and the hardware. So how good is this so-called finished version of Sir Clive's brainchild? Due to a problem of fitting the ROMs inside the QR computer, early versions of the machine were sent out with some of the operating system in a dongle, which is fitted into a cartridge slot on the rear of the machine. Probably the first thing you'll notice about the new machine, once you get out of its polystyrene box, is a total lack of any form of dongle. Yes, the dongle is now. Yes, the ROM is now inside the machine as it should have been all along. With the external power supply plugged in and the micro connected to your TV or monitor, you can start to use the QL. Before you do any work, you are asked if you're using a TV or monitor. If you have a monitor, the QR switches into 80 column mode. If you have a TV, it uses 40. It is possible to have 80 columns on a TV, but you lose characters off the edge of the screen and they are difficult to read. The display is not the best by any means, but is adequate. With the TV, the colours tend to be a little wavy. Even with a monitor that gives sharp pictures when used with other machines, the picture may not be great. It's Sinclair's cheap electronics, isn't it, really? Um, you just can't, they just can't do anything at high quality. The idea that Sinclair could do a professional business machine is frankly laughable. And speaking of which... Once you start to use the machine, you will find what is probably the most disappointing feature of the QL, the keyboard. Surprise, surprise. Most computers today have a step keyboard and real keys. The keys in the QL are totally flat, rather like a calculator keyboard. When given to a touch typist to try out, the reaction was definitely not favourable. I mean, again, I'm Clive Sinclair. Here's my professional machine. I've got a really rubbish video output from my machine and a keyboard that is absolutely Horrific. It's basically like the Spectrum Plus keyboard, 40k Plus keyboards, and it's just a rubber membrane underneath. You, at what? At what point, when you're producing a professional machine that's going to be used for word processing, do you think, no, we're not going to have a proper keyboard like everybody else. No, we're going to do our own Sinclair thing with this, this weird flat type keyboard. People complain today about the Apple keyboards being no good to type on. And, and these things were absolutely horrific. Awful, just just terrible, and it just it's just that Sinclair mindset of just no, this is perfectly fine. No, the building's burning down. This is this is perfectly fine. This this is what people want. Oh dear me! Fortunately, that picture there's rather dark. You can't really see the electronics. That's a shame. So we have to scan this. A little bit dark. So we come to storage, and there's going to be another joke, really, isn't it? Um, everybody knows. And Everybody interested in computers probably knows Sinclair has provided two micro drives rather than disk drives with the QL. Unfortunately, these drives and the small tape cartridges associated with them are nowhere near 100% reliable. If you have a Spectrum with an interface one and micro drives, you can save your programs onto cassette for security. Unfortunately, the QL has no cassette interface and you have to put all your faith in the micro drives. The main problem with the drives appears to be after the machine has been switched on for a while, the power socket is just behind the two drives and the QR gets very warm, especially towards the rear of drive 2. When the QR failed to back up the software supplied with the machine, a spokesman for Scion said this could be caused by the drives getting too hot. Turning the machine off and trying it later was his suggestion. This is just madness. Oh, you, you just... You, 
you just can't, I keep on saying, it you can't get into the mindset of Sinclair where they just think these insane things. No, we're not going to have floppy disk drives. We're going to have our insane own technology based on tape. And it doesn't work properly anyway. Incidentally, um, there was people with later versions of micro drives on the spectrum who've recovered data from the drives from 30 years ago. Apparently, when they worked and were reliable and didn't get too hot and the wind was in the right direction and so on, they could be incredibly, incredibly reliable and robust. But the problem is, on the QL here, because of the heat, they weren't. Verdict. It's a real pity the QL doesn't live up to what's expected of it. There are too many points that show a lack of thought, for example, the type of socket on the rear. In another six months, when there are a lot of add-ons and bugs in the machine to fix, the QL will probably be a good buy. At the moment, I think my money will go elsewhere. And on the following page, look, you can get a Micro Vita Cub monitor for £275, especially for your QL. Look, look it's all black and look, it looks lovely. One, I've never seen one of those on sale on eBay or anywhere. I wonder if there's many of those around. I'm guessing probably not. Um, yes, 275 for the high resolution version, 225 for the standard resolution monitor. That's a 635 by 585 pixel monitor in the uh, high resolution. It's not really high resolution by modern standards, but for 1984, that would have looked pretty cool. And look, we've got a Jaguar there shooting lasers from his eyes into the Micro Vita Cub logo. On to September the 8th, and the Commodore 16 is out. Uh, as I say, a lot of machines being launched uh, this time of year in 1984, really sorting out the men from the boys. We're starting to get Amstrad articles appearing in the magazine now as well, so recognizing the Amstrad is selling quite a lot of uh, a lot of machines now. So creditors rally, rally to Warwick. Major creditors of Cash Star Warwick, again, putting work out ways of seeing the company through its current problems, and it's, it's dead, it's gone, it's, there's no point. And uh, BBC Business Prices on a roller coaster, so they're changing their prices, being £100 on the second processor for the BBC Micro. Acorn is still sniffing around Torch, trying to uh, buy them and take them over. An Atari Axe 600 XL this week as well. So let's go to see the C16, Sweet 16. Another micro for the computing novice has emerged from Commodore. Barry Mars welcomes it with open arms. This is, of course, the C16, the replacement for the VIC-20, which is still riding high in the hardware sales charts. It's a risky decision there from Commodore to launch a new machine when your machine, old machine is still selling very, very well. Commodore delights in creating new markets, lots of different levels for its various products. It ignores incompatibilities between various models. This approach has been maintained on the 16, but in a sense, since this is intended for beginners, there's no need to maintain compatibility. Problem here is, of course, you called one machine the C16, the other machine the Commodore 64. And I've been told by people who watch Tinnyvision that a lot of people who asked for Commodore 64s that Christmas got Commodore 16s instead. Um, and there was a lot of confusion about compatibility. Would C16 games work on the C64? After all, Amstrad CPC 464 games work on a Amstrad CPC 6128. Dragon 32 games work on a Dragon 64. Spectrum 16K games work on a Spectrum 48K. Why wouldn't C16 games work on a C64? Hmm. Um... So, we're looking down here. Any shots inside the machine? And I see about the function keys and what they can do. Here we go. We've got some... So, I've got the TED... That's the TED chip there. That's the ROM chip. Uh, there's the, oh, the right processor. The TV interface, expansion slot. And uh, the ROM and the RAM and all the rest of it. So, you can see inside. Not a lot inside there, really. Layout looks very similar. To a Commodore 64, I guess, except for cut down. It's got to be cheap, hasn't it, to get it out at this price. The verdict is, the new machine provides an excellent introduction to the computing with a good basic user-friendly editing, high-resolution graphics and sound. There's a full expectation of massive support by independent software producers. Yeah. How many times do we hear that in these hardware reviews at this time? 
there's a full expectation of massive support from companies. Never seem, seems to happen. It certainly didn't happen in the case of the C16. Packages it will be. The C16 represents a good deal. Printing the value of a 16K round computer is not an issue. The VIC-20 has proved popular despite the success of the C64. The problem is the cost of the C64 is coming down, 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 and it's just going to push these machines out of existence because they're effectively they're pointless if you can buy a C64 for not a lot of more, more money. And a reminder of the specs there. And does it mention how many colours it's got? Because, of course, it does have so many 128 colours, doesn't it? Um, no. So we're into October 1984, and look, it's the Commodore Plus 4. We've had to set, reviewed the C16, and look, just to confuse matters, the Plus 4 cart has come out, and effectively it's a C16 with 64K of memory and some absolutely useless built-in apps. But hey, Commodore never knew what the left arm was doing from the right arm, did it? So uh, we'll scroll down and have a look at that. Uh, announcement about the uh, new Spectrum 48K Plus which can cost £50 more and look like a QL. Talking about the MSX. Not much else happening uh, this week. MSX software prices hit the roof. Confirming fears that the MSX software will be overpriced. Michael Peripherals has announced the game cartridges it will be importing from Japan will cost £18.95. Let's think about how much that would be in modern money, about £50. So uh, they're 64k cartridges as much memory as there is in an MSX Micro. So, yeah, and uh, Track and Field comes on two cartridges, so it would cost you £37.90. My copy of Track and Field isn't... Oh, I've got Track and Field 2. Hmm, don't know. But that's at £37.90, then you're looking at... Oh, £85.90 in modern money. And I've got some news from Amstrad here. It's, it's curious, I'm just curious, they're just pushing on, getting the 464 out, no fuss, no drama, no rumours of problems with machines, like we are with Sinclair, no arguments in other companies, like Acorn are having arguments in other companies, not going bust like Dragon and Oric, Amstrad just getting on with the job. Amstrad has rounded off its line of micro products by launching a dot matrix printer for its CPC 464 and DD1 disk units. The printer should go on almost on sale almost immediately, £200. And if there are no hitches, which there won't be because it's Amstrad, because they've probably already got this stuff in the country, Amstrad will deserve another pat on the back for a pace that's just producing add-ons for the 464. Look how long it took Oryx, Sinclair and others to come up with storage systems and printers for their respective micros. Again, where they've recognised is what I've said there. Amstrad is getting on with this stuff without a fuss, without making all the mess-ups and mistakes the other companies are making. And we're into the software charts. Day Thompson Tacathon is number one. Elite is at number three. That's only available on the BBC Micro as well. So just on the sole sales of the BBC Micro version, it's it's popped up to number 15 and at a price of £15. That's very impressive sales. Doesn't need to be number one when the number one's costing only £7.90 and your game is £15. I'm sure Acorn Softer literally rubbing their hands together at all the profits coming in from Elite. And we've got the charts for the sales of different micros down here as well. The Amstrad's making its way up the charts. V20 is still selling strongly. And actually very interesting. Very interesting. Because we've got separate sales figures for the Amstrad CPC 464 with green screen and the colour version. Which is interesting because if you combine number 7 and number 4... How high would the CPC actually be? Number three, number two? That's extremely interesting. Also goes to prove what I've always said, which I know to be true. Most users had a colour monitor. Um, we've got the colour monitor at 349, outselling the green screen at 299 there. Um, probably by quite a factor, considering the green screen is selling less than the VIC-20, and the colour version is selling more than the BBC Micro. But that's very interesting why they haven't combined the sales of those units, the Memotech is uh, sinking down to number 9 there. Oh, it's still hanging at number 10. So the Commodore Plus 4 is out. Commodore is set to aim its Plus 4 at first-time buyers for serious home and introductory business use. Offering fundamentally the same operating system as the Commodore 16, the Plus 4 is aimed at the first-time buyer for serious home use. 
an introductory business use price at 299 and it competes on price with the Commodore 64 at 199 Oh, hang on, hang on. Is the Plus 4 100 pounds more than the Commodore 64? Oh, my life. Commodore, you lunatics. You are insane. What are you doing? You've got the Commodore 64, a fantastic computer. You've priced at £100 less than this pile of tat. That just, just, you just, you just wonder what drugs were these people on, the people who ran these companies. Just any of us could walk in there and say, no, don't do that. Just, just put out a Commodore 16, put out the C64, market the C64, because as that is your main micro. But no, you're putting out this, this, this C16 with 64k of RAM and for built-in useless applications and charging a hundred pounds more for it than the Commodore 64. You 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 lunatics, Commodore. You're you're mad. You, you, you just no wonder. Oh my goodness knows it took him ten years more to go bust from here. But th this is the making of it. This is the kind of lunacy that was going on. Oh hang on, it gets better. For serious use you need at least the cassette unit making the plus four look rather expensive at 350 pounds. So the cassette unit was an extra fifty pounds, and that would have come free, included with C sixty four. No, if my memory is correct. Oh, just Ugh. clearly Commodore is following its usual pattern of high prices to begin with, progressive reductions over time. It'd be too late. This thing's dead in the water. This is a marketing method proved by its profits and world bar sales. Currently said to be two million VIX and a similar number of sixty fours expected to be sold by the end of nineteen eighty four. Yes, but you got the VIC-20 right, you're getting the Commodore 64 right, and you're getting the Plus 4 and the C16 wrong. PCN taking a bit of a stab at Commodore here. Uh, Commodore say, we are the volume producers, so our design is the standard. PCN adding, accordingly, we have non-standard cassette connectors, non-standard cassette units, and non-standard joystick connections, and a serial disc connection. Yes, ex exactly. I mean, Commodore just kind of doing their own thing. Just being the biggest doesn't make you the standard. So PCN says, so will it sell at the price quoted? I think so. The sales of the VIC are against the natural law of the market. It is astounding that machine with under 4K memories continue to sell against a market background of 16-bit and perhaps 32-bits with memories of 128K and 256K becoming commonplace. Um, Really, the VIC-20 sells because it's got a it's cheap, cheap as anything. It's got an established software base and established support. That, that's why the VIC still continues to sell. That's why the Atari 2600 continued to sell for years and years and years into, into the early 90s. You're thinking, who were buying these things? And the answer was people buying them from catalogs and things like that who didn't know about computers, but they were still selling. And here, the VIC 20 is still selling, even though it, it, the specifications compared to the C64 pathetic people still want it because it's got software support and it's cheap the plus four doesn't have software support and it certainly isn't cheap and here we've got a pick peek at the inside um familiar to any plus four runner who's had to open theirs up because it's broken uh, mine my machine's an amalgamation of i think three plus fours to get a working machine a big capacitor there i think mine's all been replaced when the future was 8-bit uh, refurbed all mine got it working um let's go to the summary the plus four is an interesting machine with a lot of good features as with all design there are compromises however there is enough of everything to keep most purchasers very happy perhaps it's a little pricey time will tell what this should say is the plus four is extremely expensive don't buy it go and get a c64 instead just skipping on to november the third uh, the Spectrum Plus Sinclair's bestseller grows up. So it's a 48K with a rotten old Sinclair keyboard for £50 more. And you can win Nemesex system as well this week. So, oh, Sinclair Speculates 5. Another version of the Sinclair Spectrum could appear in the spring, which may mean an earlier version of the Spectrum will be phased out. That presumably is going to be the 128K, early 85. Sounds about right to me. And the charts, as featured on Radio 1's Saturday morning chip shop, Dave Thompson's decathlon is still number one. Jet Set Willie is back up 
Uh, to number two, Beach at number three, Elite at number four, still only available on the Acorn. Sherlock Holmes, uh, 4095 at number five, and how the micro is selling. Um, Commodore 64 is number one this week. Uh, Sinclair Spectrum number two, BBC B number three, Amstrad CPC number four. Interesting to see how the CPCs is creeping up there, getting into the market, holding its own. Still, it's at first Christmas. This is a very weak Christmas in terms of demand for 8 bit micros. Um, Amstrad selling a lot in the UK, but actually, a lot of these machines they've got are going off to France and Spain as well. Oh, we've got a DK Tronics advert as well. Um, showing some expansions on there. All our peripherals are fully compatible with the new Spectrum Plus. Doesn't say what those peripherals are, but never mind. Sir Clive strikes back. It has long been suspected that Sinclair was going to strike back at his competitors with a brother for the Spectrum. John Lettice evaluates Sinclair's chunkier answer, the Spectrum Plus. The new Spectrum Plus shares the same styling as his older brother, but it's a little smaller. The Plus seems to be designed to be the machine that, for a price, almost £180, gives you a half-decent keyboard, half-decent being the word. Uh, this has always been seen as one of the major problems with the traditional Spectrum, although Sinclair is said to have thought about it as a business rather than a games machine. Initially, its serious use of the machine has been limited. Uh, Sir Clive is noted for his spirited defence of his keyboards, but if he starts claiming the Plus keyboard is a stroke of ergonomic genius, I'll personally go around to Sinclair Research. The full stop key is in the conventional position, more or less, but the comma, semicolon, and inverted comma keys are tucked into the bottom row, just below the cap shift keys. As IBM contrived to do this on its industry standard keyboards, Sinclair is good in good company here, but most southern micro manufacturers have the sense to put the shift keys in the bottom deck. I can see a lot of people getting annoyed about their pros being full of extraneous punctuation. Sinclair's launched a machine that could have clearly been cheaper or better. The new keyboard can't, taking economics of scale into account, cost anything like £50, and at £130-£140, the Plus would have been a clear winner. Similarly, for a few bob more, an Amstrad with built-in interface one and cartridge slot could have been produced. So they're saying they could have, Sinclair should have produced something like the, as very interesting, what PCN are basically saying is, that Sinclair could have produced something like Amstrad was selling. This is, well, ooh, 18 months before Amstrad got their hands on Sinclair and effectively produced a Sinclair Spectrum in an Amstrad case. That's an interesting observation there from PCN. The clincher, as far as I'm concerned, is the lack of composite video output. This costs one socket and two blobs of solder, and failing to put it on the plus is just plain silly. Fair point, there's composite on the edge connector, and Sinclair could easily have included that, but did not. But all is not lost. All Clive has to do is what I've been telling his people to do for months. Discontinue the Spectrum Minus. I've heard dark rumours about this more anonymous. Spectrum Minus? Hmm. What well, that is. Drop the price of the plus to around £130 and produce a new machine. Call it the Spectrum Squared at around £190. This would have a built-in interface, one, a Centronics interface, and a real keyboard. All good stuff. I mean, again, it's like Commodore. You just you just look at Sinclair and go, why can't you do things properly? And Sinclair fans be cross me saying that. Commodore fans be cross me saying these things. But some of these things are so obvious that you wonder what planet Sir Clive and all these other people were living on that they could have had these absolutely killer micros and they just did all these weird things. Finally, we go on to just December. Uh, there's not a lot going on in the final issue of PCN of the year, but what we will do is we have a quick look and to see what the machines are are selling. And uh, Mastertronic are offering £2.99 games now as of December 1984. And obviously this is not the... Um, this would be late November sales, I guess, because of the delay between the charts and publishing. But Night Law is number one. Um, Ghostbusters number two. Elite is still hanging in number three. It's dropped down. Last week was number seven. Now it's number three. Um, Dave Thompson's Decathlon is still hanging in there. What I want to see is what the micros are doing. And uh, we've got the Memotech number 10. MSX is coming in at number nine there. 
MSX series. That's all the different machines of the MSX series, not individual, but all the different machines. Conversely, we've had to have the Spectrum Plus and the Spectrum listed separately. Sometimes these charts make no sense at all. You've got the MSX series, Toshiba, Hitachi, all these other machines, Sanyo, all grouped in together at number nine. And they've got the Spectrum Plus and the Spectrum at number two and number six, respectively. And have the Amstrad machines been combined in or not? Or is the green screen Amstrad outside of the top ten? Who knows? Um, so, ostensibly, the C64 is number one, but actually probably isn't, because probably the Spectrum combined is outselling it. It's all a bit odd, but at least gives you an idea of what was going on the, in the charts at the end of the year, even if it's all a bit mixed up. So look, I've gone on for ages now, talking about 1980, second half of 1984. Hope that's been an interesting delve into PCN uh, for the second half of the year. Um, PCN finishes the middle of 1985, so very, very soon we have run through the final editions of personal computer news that will take us right through to the launch of the Atari ST.